Uh, so let's start by introducing ourselves. Um, let's start with Leslie. Please introduce yourself and tell us the story of how you became a top business leader, Leslie. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Leslie Bauman. And you can probably tell by my accent that I'm from Texas originally. I'm married a Miami guy. That's how I ended up in Miami. And even though I'm a doctor, I'm a dermatologist, I my whole life loved reading business books. And I grew up worshiping people like Estee Lauder and Helena Rubenstein and other female CEOs in the skincare industry. Um, in 2005, I wrote a skincare book that was a bestseller and led to me starting a company called Skin Tech Solutions, and it's software that 220 doctors around the country use. And I've been involved with TTI now for about five years, and it's a great group. I've met so many wonderful women in here, many mentors, many friends. So if you have never been to a meeting before this one, you're going to want to come again because you're going to meet great people. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Jessica, tell us about yourself. Who are you and how did you become a top business leader? Sure. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jessica Browdy and I own J. Kelly Advisors Project Management. We are a certified woman-owned business that specializes in full-service, solution-driven project management. We represent owners, developers, equity, and lenders by looking out for our clients' best interests while providing technical expertise and oversight during the various stages of your projects. Uh, I became a top businesswoman, I think, by searching for growth, both personally and professionally. My degree is in architecture, and I worked my first few years as an architect until I realized in order to be a good architect, I need to learn how to build. So I left the architecture world and worked for a general contractor for nine years and really just learned how to sequence work, read technical drawings and specs, estimate work, and manage multiple trades and complex projects. And it came time to move on and I joined Cressa uh, as an owner's rep and then stayed on there until they sold to JLL, to JLL uh, where I came on as vice president of projects. Um, I left after about a year and uh, just needed a break. It was a tough year for me personally and professionally and took some time off. And during that time, I got some calls to say, hey, would you run this project? And I kept saying no until finally I was just wondering how long is the universe going to reach out and keep handing me something in my lap and I kept keep saying no so I said yes finally and just since then hit the ground running. Excellent. Thank you Jessica. Leah tell us about yourself and how you became a top business leader. So it's interesting um, my training is nursing. I am a nurse by training and quite honestly I didn't want to be um, a top leader. I didn't want to be uh, a suit in any stretch of the imagination. I wanted to take care of patients. That's what I love doing. Um, but I think there are any um, skills and abilities that one has. And of course, some amazing mentors along the way that kind of push you, nudge you um, into into what you don't even realize is your destiny. And um, because I grew up in a household where you weren't allowed to really say anything unless you were gonna be part of the solution, I decided that I didn't have to be like the suits I experienced as a nurse. I could do something a little bit different. And with um, the amazing mentors I've had throughout my career, along with a lot of education and some outstanding experiences, I've just kind of worked my way up through the ranks. In some cases, kicking and screaming, um, but I realized that I could have a much bigger impact on patients and on healthcare um, being in a leadership role. So um, it was a lot of a lot of pushing and um, and a whole lot of divine intervention for me. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And Mindy, tell us about yourself and how you became a top business leader. All right, so we will come back while our stage crew tries to solve this problem. Uh, we'll go back and hear from Mindy in a little bit, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you each about, and we'll hear about this from Mindy later as well, um, is about the role models and mentors you had in your early career. Um, so Jessica, why don't you tell us a story about a role model or mentor you had early in your career? Sure. So I think early on, my role model was actually my mom. She gave me super strong work ethic. Um, she was a single mom, worked three jobs, 
So Anne went back to school uh, later on in life while we were going through high school uh, in my, my end years in middle school uh, to be a speech pathologist. So she went back to graduate school. So worked three jobs, went to graduate school and raised my brother and I. So she was probably my, my first role model. And then into my career, probably about halfway into my career, I met a woman who owned a subcontracting business, Eloise. Uh, she's on one of the top 50, so congratulations to her. Um, so she owned a subcontracting business and was also a mother. And I said, if she can do it, you know, I can do it. So it was nice to see somebody who looked like me out there doing it, um, especially in, in our world, subcontracting and, and general contracting. It's, it's, it's a difficult business to be in. So um, she was really probably my first mentor and really took me under her wing and reached out to me and um, just connected with me. And just having that connection really made me feel supported. And then uh, I'd say lastly, my TCI sisters joining the TCI forum and being a part of the forum for the last, gosh, I think it's been maybe close to nine years now has been phenomenal. And just the support and the um, tidbits of wisdom from from each individual woman has has led me to be able to start my own business. Excellent. Thank you, Jess. And thanks for that uh, shout out to our forum. I know I met Eloise and you through our forum. So that's more about the power of TCI. Yes. Maybe let's try it again. No, oh, I still can't hear you. Okay. I promise we will come back. Patrick is helping, right? So um, let's hear another story about a mentor or role model. Leslie, tell us about your early mentors or role models. Um, well, I read a book a long time ago called Going to the Top, and it said that you should look at people in different jobs that you might be interested in and learn about them. So in my world, one could be being a dermatologist, one could be doing clinical research, one could be working for pharmaceutical companies, another one could be being involved with skincare brands or skincare brand research. So I met different people in all of those fields and asked them to mentor me and got to know them. And... Um, that's really how I figured out what I wanted to do and what kind of subtype of dermatologist I wanted to be. So I actually pursued mentors and, and, and I was one of those pushy people that said, please give me advice. And I always like to say, what is the best thing you've done in your career and what is the worst thing you've done? Or, you know, um, what would you advise me not to do and not waste my time to do? And that has been really, really helpful advice because um, there's probably a lot of time I didn't waste by getting this great advice from my mentors. Now, because I am um, in the age that I am, there weren't that many female doctors at the time. So most of my mentors were male, but I have uh, two really great female mentors. One used to run Neutrogena, and um, she taught me a lot about how marketing worked in the skincare world. Interesting. Yes. Well, marketing is always key, right? I, I still believe that marketing is everything and everything is marketing, but uh, we could debate that, um, I suppose. Um, and now we have Mindy back. Mindy, how are Let's you? See. It's third time of charm. Boy, after all that, I better live up to uh, expectations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so for your question. Let's tell about you and how you became a leader and maybe a story about a mentor. So they're actually, I think, kind of intertwined. Uh, thank you again for having me. I feel really humbled to be in this amazing company and not just obviously fellow panelists, but I know the amazing women who have joined us today. Um, I have the, the real honor of leading my hometown newspaper, the Miami Herald, then on Level Herald. And um, like Leah, I kind of stumbled into management. Um, I was a reporter. Um, I started my career at the Miami Herald as an intern um, just a few years ago. And, uh, and so I, I thought I was going to be a reporter for life. And it was a female editor um, shortly after I had my, my first child, my son, who suggested that I try editing. And I can tell you that for edit, for reporters, moving into editing and management is like, you know, you're crossing a line. Um, and so my, my instinct was to, to say no. I didn't really want to go into management, but um, I, I said we worked out a bargain, which was you try it for three months. And um, if you don't like it, you can go back to reporting. And if we don't think you're good at it, you know, we'll also, 
you can go back to reporting. So I thought we came up with a really fail safe way to me to try it. I think the lesson for me there was, you know, you can plan your career um, as much as you want, but you have to also be open to opportunities um, and you have to be open to what others might see in you potentials. Um, um, I think, you know, you know, that's what we're hearing that somebody might see something in you or a career path for yourself that you don't see for yourself. And, and it opens a door that I would I would never have really, I don't think investigated on my own. It seems to be a theme, you're right. A, a lot of us have um, gone in not necessarily sure or even not knowing that this was where we would end up. So that's that's a really good point. Good. Leah, do you have a story about a role model or a mentor to share? Sure. So as I said earlier, I um, my training is in nursing. And my earliest professional mentors were the preceptors and charge nurses who really taught me the importance of blending clinical and leadership skills with compassion and commitment to safety and quality. So in my office, I still have, and if I had the, the time, I would pull the picture out. I have a picture of myself as a very young 20-year-old nurse taking care of a critically ill child in the pediatric ICU. And I keep that picture facing my desk as a reminder that when I'm sitting here at this big old desk, um, making really tough decisions, um, sometimes controversial decisions, to always be mindful of my roots, where I started from, and why I really am in this business, right? I'm in the business of taking care of patients and families, um, and that they always have to come first. But as I rose through the ranks, uh, my mentors included, and still do to this day, my mom, of course, I think some of us mentioned their mom, um, my family members, uh, senior leaders in the various organizations that I've worked for, uh, pastoral leaders, community leaders, and in some cases, those who weren't so outstanding at what they did. Um, I'm a firm believer that you can learn from anyone. And in some cases, in my case, um, I've been placed in situations to help me learn what not to do. So I've been very blessed, very fortunate to have a wide array of, of people to mentor me, to push me when I needed a little nudge, um, and kind of hold my hand through the process. So it's been a pleasure experience. I think it's really good to think of our mentors, not just as people who supported us and held our hands and people we want to look like, but people we learned from who were not so admirable or we learned things that weren't what we wanted to follow. Um, I think that's a really good point, Leah. Excellent. Thank you. So, let's talk a little bit about strengths as a leader. Um, I know that when we prepared for this, um, we talked about strengths a little bit and, you know, a few of you had strengths as a leader that you wanted to call out. Um, let's start with Mindy. What are your strengths as a leader? Where, where does your strength come from? Uh, and then what are your areas for growth? Because we all have those. Yeah, I think, um, again, I think there's a yin and yang to that. Um, I like to think that one of my strengths is that I really love um, collaboration and I love to cast a wide net um, when I'm making decisions for ideas and solutions and, and ideation. I love that as my staff will tell you, some of them may be wincing a little bit because the problem becomes sometimes that when you do that, you can really, um, sometimes it, it really delays decision making because you're trying to get so much input and be so inclusive so I had to try to learn to um, surround myself with people who are who can be a counterbalance to that. Um, while while really I, I really f feed off the energy of others, and so it's really important for me to have it. But I also need to understand and have learned and have to reflect that there's a point where you have to just stop. You know, it's like over-reporting, which is also something I suffered from <laughs> so journalist early in my career. You know, that's the fun part. You have to talk to people and they have to sit down and write. So. I, I, I think that's the balance, the yin and the yang. I try to um, be inclusive because I, I, I just love to hear different points of view. And I think that that's how ideas build on each other. But then I need to, I've had to learn to when, to when to pull the trigger and just make a decision and move forward because that's really more important than ever now. Um, as, as everyone here can attest to, right, with um, 
the way that all of our industries have been impacted by technology and change. Yeah, I think that's true. I think things are moving faster than ever. And I think we need to learn a lesson that took me a while to learn, but I'm all in on it now, which is sometimes done is better than perfect. Um, you know, you have, you have to ship it. You have to print the paper. You have to get it done. Yeah. So, Leah, you also mentioned you had some strengths that you wanted to talk about and maybe some things where you wanted to grow. So I think my strengths lie in um, some of those basic values that you get as you're, as you're growing up, as you're being um, mentored by your mom and, and other strong women in your life. Um, honesty and being straightforward is really um, one of my gifts. I think um, I make it a point to, at all times, maintain the highest levels of integrity. That's extremely important, especially in my business. And, um, you know, that, that's difficult sometimes. You're put into very um, occasionally uncomfortable positions, and you really have to have the courage of your convictions to really stand up and, and hold on to that integrity. Um, I'm also an excellent communicator and team builder. I've been doing that for 33 years. So um, I think I, I do a pretty decent job with that. Um, but one of the greatest gifts I think is the ability to identify talent and have the comfort level of surrounding yourself with people who are far smarter than you are. And it takes time. It takes time in your development. It takes time um, as you build your own confidence to be okay with having a team of people who are so amazing and so much better than you because you realize that that talent is going to get you where you need to go as a team. There's not one person, myself or anyone else on my team, that's more important than the other. And I think finally, my um, growing over time is my lack of fear in taking chances. I think that um, when you make mistakes is the only time that you really grow. So you've got to take some calculated risks and you've got to be okay with making mistakes and okay with your team members making mistakes. Um, because again, I think really it's through my own personal and professional mistakes that my career has been able to blossom. So that's where some of the, the strengths lie. I think my opportunities probably are both a double-edged sword. I am very much a visionary. I can see exactly where we need to go, what we need to do to get there. And what I, um, what I really believe is that, and what I know and have learned through some hard knocks is that I have to give my team, A, the ability to participate in building that vision so that they too can believe in it as much as I do. Because once they do, there's nothing really that's gonna stop us from achieving it. So I wanna hit the ground running and let's just go, go, go. But the onus is on me as a leader to kind of step back, make sure that it's an inclusive process and make sure that the vision is something that means as much to them as it does to me. So basically I need to be patient with myself as well as my team and getting us there. And then finally, I think most people who know me um, and some who don't, <laughs> I shoot straight from the hip. You always know where I stand. And, um, and that honesty and that integrity sometimes, again, can be a double-edged sword. I have to be very mindful of my audience and of my delivery. Because as a, a great leaders will adapt that message and that delivery to the audience so that their end goal is met. I can't, you know, there are some people on my team who say to me, just give it to me straight. I just want it straight. And then there are others, when you're too straight, it sort of causes them to, to retreat. And that's not what you want to do. You want that style and the delivery of the message to bring out the best in who you're working with. So, um, so just being mindful and being patient um, and, and, and not letting the New Yorker in me take over the Floridian in me. I think those are all really great points. And I think that um, your comment about being okay with mistakes and learning from mistakes is something that I feel is really important and a little hard to do, you know, a little bit hard to get to and even to stick with. Um, but certainly surrounding yourself with a team that is 
smarter than you, that knows things that you don't. And in my case, surrounding myself with a team that knows things that I didn't grow up with because they're a lot younger than me is really helpful as well. Good. So let's talk about obstacles. Jessica, did you encounter obstacles early in your career? Tell us about the obstacles and how you overcame them. Sure. Um, I mean, definitely I encountered obstacles. I'd say my first obstacle was um, realizing after I'd gone to school for architecture, knowing that that's definitely what I was going to be. I was going to be an architect and I was going to practice. And once I got into the practice, I realized, wow, this is, this is not, not really maybe what I want to do. And maybe I want to learn more sides of the business. And um, so that was a real eye opener for me. And it was an obstacle because I, I hadn't figured out exactly what I was going to do next. And, and like the other ladies have said, I kind of fell into the other opportunity to work in, in general construction. And um, then I think growing up through the general construction world, I really ran into a lot of obstacles of being a young woman um, in mostly working with all men. And so really trying to learn and probably taking more time than my counterparts and spending more time, staying later, trying to make sure that I knew everything so that if I was questioned or um, when I came to the table at a meeting, I knew what I was going to say. And so I think after, you know, kind of growing and working really hard and through a lot of effort, um, you know, I gained that respect. Um, but it was definitely an obstacle early on in my career. And I think I was also very blessed to work with a lot of great men who encouraged me and supported me. Um, and also having a wonderful husband who has always been my sounding board. So being able to, to bounce off of him, and he's in the industry as well, but to be able to bounce off of him and, and you know, be confident in my next move or where I wanted to go or grow to, having that support has always been, um, I think, been able to allow me to maneuver through obstacles um, with a lot of resilience. Excellent. Leslie, tell us about obstacles and how you've overcome them. Well, over the years, there have been many obstacles. Um, I was the first cosmetic dermatologist at a university in the country, and um, people frowned on that. They said it wasn't real medicine. And I have a folder of mean letters that people wrote to the University mm -hmm. of Miami of, how dare you do this fluff field that isn't skin cancer? And um, I had to go lecture on things that people didn't think were important. And that really led me to write my textbook on cosmetic dermatology because I wanted to show people that there was a lot of science involved in that. Um, my, I had an uncle who was very well known because he invented an antifungal drug. And he, he even said, this is, what are you doing going into the beauty world? That's not medicine. So it took me years, but now it's a very scientific field. There's a lot of research, um, the people, the doctors lecturing, and they actually are showing references now and everything. So I, I think it takes a long time to change people's impressions. But I think one of my strengths is I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid of failure at all. I've failed many, many times. And the way I like to tell my mentees is, is imagine you're in a horse race and you have six horses in the race. It's okay if five of them lose. You just need one to win. So a failure isn't a failure. It's just one of your horses didn't make it, and you should just know up front that's how it's going to be. So my obstacles have been overcome just by having as many horses in the race as I can have. Excellent. It's a, it's a good strategy. Mindy, obstacles and how you've overcome them. My goodness. I mean, I think... Um, you know, a lot. Of, I think there's been some. I mean, a lot of obstacles. I don't think I faced the, the huge, um, the huge, some of the huge ones that we've heard um, from from you know um, my co-panelists. But I think um, you know, I think the biggest obstacle for me has been myself. Um, I think um, I, I think I, I, you know, that that imposter syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. That's the thing that I always have had in the background, right? Playing out like should do you really deserve this job and you know are you you know and, and blurting out things that like no man would ever blurt out when you're given a great opportunity like hey i don't know that i'm ready for that which you know um 
And, and, and so I think that if I think about what I have, the trajectory of my career, I think conquering my own um, internal um, dialogue with really a lot of help from my husband, it helps to have a, a strong partner, you know, help you think like a man, you know, when you, when you most need it. And, um, it. It has been really important. So that's really what I try to tell young women. You know, I'm, I, I would just say, you know, if you're feeling insecure, you know, run to the bathroom, lock yourself there for a few minutes and then come back out. Pretend you had allergies if you were, you know, and then just like, yeah, go for it, you know, because I think you have to um, exude, I think, sometimes a self-confidence that we don't have. So it's kind of the fake it till you make it um, approach that I think I, I, I had to learn um, rather than wearing my own insecurities outward, which I don't think is a, which, I, you know, we all know people already are ready to doubt you um, as a woman and, and as a woman of color. So the last thing you need to do is to, you know, add fuel to that fire. So I think um, that's been my biggest obstacle in terms of my career. Interesting. You know, fake it till you make it, or I always like to say act as if, is something I hear a lot when we have conversations like this, right? I mean, just act as if you know how to do it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Act as if you do. Right. Um, that's one of those phrases that is always in the back of my head. Leah, do you have obstacles that have come from being a woman or other obstacles that, that you want to share and how you've overcome them? So I've had, I think early in my career, the obstacles were less about being a woman and it was more related to being an African-American woman. Um, you know, in my earlier years, it was nursing and nursing leadership and it is a, a female uh, dominated field. I think as I worked my way up through the ranks, depending on what organization I was in, there were definitely um, issues related to being a woman. But fortunately for me, I had gotten to a point, to that point in my career, where I had such amazing mentors who helped to build my confidence um, and to help and to continually be like that whisper in my ear telling me, you are good enough. You are enough. You are not perfect. You will make your mistakes. But you have worked hard and you deserve to be there like any other man or any other non-African-American, uh, you, you deserve to be there. So, and it took me a long time to get to that point of confidence because, um, because you do have so many other voices in your head. And I think that surrounding yourself with a circle of influence or a circle of people who are there to help build you up, i.e. TCI, right? To be around professional women who are constantly looking to build you up, give you opportunities to build them up, I think has helped me to overcome those obstacles. And, and finally, I got to a point in my career where while I still absolutely suffer from the imposter syndrome, like any other person, male, female, somewhere in the back of your head, you're thinking, oh, what did I get myself into? But for the most part, I I believe, I, I faked it until I made it in terms of believing I deserve to be there. And now I know it. So, but it takes time. And there's always times where you're doubtful, um, but I am an obstacle remover. I do that for everyone else and I have to do it for myself. So that's part of my role. And you just, just keep plugging and you just keep hitting your head until there's not just cracks in that ceiling and that glass ceiling, but we've shattered it. And um, my hope is that I, it, it gets shattered by the time the next generation, my nieces, um, my, my best friend's kids, those women have just fly through the roof. Nice. Nice. It's good to hear about how leaders in our community have felt some of the same things that I feel and felt some of the same things that I know a lot of the people in the audience feel about, well, am I, am I good enough? Or why don't they think I'm good enough? And I'm going to prove this. I mean, there's lots of different um, emotions that come up as we think about, as we think about our careers. So as we're getting to know you all um, 
in a, in a general way and asking some of the same questions of everyone, I want to dive a little bit deeper with each of you um, and ask a very specific question for each of you about your own business. Um, so let's start with Jessica. Um, Jessica, you've been an entrepreneur for about five years. Tell us why you decided to become your own boss, a little more detail on that than you've shared with us already. And what has surprised you about it? I think, um, you know, in my career, I've worked for a couple big companies and I always felt like I had really good ideas and was constantly trying to make things with the project manager and me more efficient, um, better for outcomes for the customer. And how could I do that? Um, how could I shorten the A to B time and, and make sure that the value that's coming out of that is the right value. And so I'd always be focused on that in, in hindsight. Now I realize that's what I was focused on. And I would come up with these ideas that would either take in a big company forever for the ship to turn for it to be implemented, or if it eventually was implemented, it, the idea was was lost or you know it didn't come from me. So it was it was frustrating. And I realized that you know, by continuing to try to push and steer and push and steer, I was losing steam. So I wanted to be able to kind of challenge myself and, and continually be able to, I think maybe it was Mindy who mentioned about reiterating, you know, using the people that are around you. Uh, I think Leah said like the, the strong people who are around you that you look up to, that you surround yourself with to make yourself a stronger and better leader. Um, taking taking those people and you know bringing them into the fold and and reiterating the ideas to make them the most streamlined, the most value based ideas and and bringing them to the business and being an entrepreneur you know you have the flexibility and ability to empower those ideas and also take those ideas from the people who work for you and say hey let's come together we're all sitting here as leaders at the table. Um, kind of a shared notion of leadership um, and getting the best ideas from the smartest people in the room, not being afraid to use them and, and move quickly and, and flexibly on those ideas. Nice. And has that specifically surprised you about being an entrepreneur, how important it is to surround you with others or are there other surprises? I don't know that I was surprised. I think it was really fulfilling to see that the ideas were working, that they were successful, or knowing that if something wasn't working, to be able to change, um, change strategy and and uh, move in a different direction. So, I mean, I think there wasn't a lot that surprised me about being an entrepreneur. I think what surprised me was that I needed to be an entrepreneur, and that was the hardest decision to make. Excellent. And it, it seems to have turned out even better than you imagined in a lot of ways, just in terms of the way you're working with others and that collaborative piece you just spoke about. Definitely. Good. Leslie, you're a doctor, a researcher, an inventor, a teacher, a writer, a mentor, and more. Tell us the role which you found most compelling in the past several months and why. Well, of all the things I do, I like being a teacher the most. And it's funny because when I was a mom, I'd always say, you're going to be a teacher. And I just took a very long route to that. Um, I'm always, lately I've been doing a lot of webinars and I write in a lot of germ journals and everything. And I never get tired. I'm a science nerd. I read all the dermatology journals every month. Um, and I love to read nature and science and all that stuff. And I like to take that and then reformat it and give it out to the world in a way that they can understand. And I like to come up with metaphors and things like that. So for me, it's um, being a teacher. And so I'm fascinated with what's happening online and all the technologies, just like the conference today. The way to communicate with the world and teach the world is getting easier and easier. So with my skin type solutions system that I have, it's software that doctors use to generate skincare recommendations for their patients. So I get to teach all these dermatologists and their staff, their estheticians, and even their patients about skincare. And I love that. So I've built this infrastructure where I can be a teacher. 
That's great. And I think, you know, many of us in our careers have found ourselves in that teacher role, like it or not. And I think, you know, you, you rise to it and you say, well, I know something that I can share and look how interesting and how different it makes um, the, the group and the other people that I'm teaching. So that's, that's really rewarding, I think. Good. So Leah, as the CEO of Memorial Hospital West, can you tell us about how your employees are doing and any programs you have in place to help them manage personal challenges um, during uh, this particular time in our lives? So, you know, it's interesting. We have always been focused on the people pillar of our organization. Um, we've always done an outstanding job, I think, in making sure that they were okay. But as you say, the times that we're experiencing now with COVID, with social injustices, et cetera, there's just so much pressure uh, on so many of our staff members. You know, we take for granted that the nurse who is um, married, whose husband was laid off, isn't they're now dependent on one salary or that school is virtual and I'm a single mom taking care of two children, trying to figure out how I worked full time in a 12 hour shift and at the same time, make sure that my small children who are in a virtual learning environment are doing okay. So we offer a variety of programs and services um, to assist our employees in managing their personal challenges. Um, we have wellness programs to assist um, our folks to achieve and maintain highest levels of physical and mental well-being, mindfulness programs. We do yoga, acupuncture, tai chi. All of this is for free for our, for our staff. Um, we've had to, to enhance our communication um, because we are we, we take a great deal of pride in spending a lot of face time with our employees, with our physicians. And because of COVID, we've not been able to do that. So we have transitioned, not unlike TCI with this ceremony, we've transitioned a lot of our um, communication strategy to online, live, but online, so that our, our employees, our physicians have that face-to-face -face contact with us. But in addition to that, we've created food pantries for our employees who may not have enough food. We've done food drives for our frontline employees, as well as um, for first responders. We've um, amped up our financial and um, retirement planning for employees. We're subsidizing now about 50% of um, what we call back to school camp. We're doing that in partnership with the YMCA. So for $200, a mom, for example, employee who is a full-time employee who can't do virtual um, learning at home with their children can take their children to the Y. They have teachers that are there and we're paying 50% of it to, to help, you know, help cut the cost for them. Um, we've increased access to spiritual care. All of our facilities have a non-denominational prayer that occurs um, three times a week. So people can have that outlet if that's what, what works for them. Um, we're offering complimentary meals right now to our employees um, just to kind of offset the price of having to pay for lunch for those who might be struggling financially. Um, we've also developed what we call the Employee Relief Fund. Um, this is 100% funded by employee donations of what we call paid leave, but some organizations call it PTO, other organizations call it vacation time. But employees who have excess hours donate to this fund. And what, that, what happens is employee, for example, who is behind three months in a mortgage can appeal and try to get money from that fund. And oftentimes, rarely, I will say, do we deny that. For someone who's behind in a car, car payment, we will um, help subsidize them catching up until the financial state of this country gets back on its feet. Um, and then I think what we've also done to try to really, <coughs> excuse me, personalize it is to, we get a great deal of um, feedback from our staff and physicians about the thank you notes. We do um, hand written thank you notes to our employees. Sometimes we stick a movie, um, a movie a card into it. Now we don't do movies because there's no movie theaters open, but we'll give a Starbucks or a, um, or a, uh, you know, pizza 
gift card into that note just to say, listen, we noticed that you did something. We know that you've been working really hard and we appreciate you. There's a lot to be said. And I think someone said it earlier. I don't re recall which one of my colleagues on the panel did, but there's a lot to be said about the little things that you do to show appreciation. So we've spent a great deal of our time making sure that they have as much support as possible that may have nothing to do with their work life, but everything to do with their personal life. We believe that when people can come to work, um, not worried about where their kids are, not worried about um, you know, how the next payment is gonna be, then they're gonna give us 100%, or more importantly, they're gonna give our patients and their families 100%. So we've got, that's just really a small, I, I could go on and on and on, I don't wanna take up too much time, but there's a lot that we try to do to make sure that that paper pillar, our most valuable asset, which are our people who are on those front lines, get what they need. Okay, I can't hear you, Janet. Sorry, I accidentally okay, hit you. I to make sure I, you didn't lose me. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I am here. So Mindy, tell us about the changes and challenges in the news business and where you see independent journalism going in the future. So I think we're at an absolutely pivotal time in this country um, for journalism and particularly, I think, a crisis in local journalism. Um, you know, the only uh, industry, right, that's uh, protected by the, 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 the First Amendment and, and absolutely a bedrock to our democracy. So where we find ourselves this year is in a really interesting place. I mean, this is one of the most I, I don't even know, I don't find the right adjective. This is one of the most important news years, right, of, of that I can recall in my history. And we've covered a lot, a lot of things. You know, we started off the year with a, with a pandemic. Um, and then we have um, a historic social justice movement um, in between, uh, you know, the, a couple of hurricanes as we lead up to a, a presidential elections. And so we are, Meanwhile, right, the industry has been plagued by um, a financial, a business model, right, that is outdated, that doesn't work anymore, um, that's relied so much on um, advertising, and it's been disrupted completely by the Googles and the Facebook of this world. So I think two things about where we are right now. I think um, number one is that I think that the importance of local journalism and how it actually impacts your life has never been more important. And I think we've been able to demonstrate that. Um, we see so many readers and our increased audience coming to us because you know it's not enough to just read the New York Times to figure out what's going on with coronavirus because it's not telling you what's going on in your own backyard. And so that's our mission. Um, our staff has been working literally almost round the clock to provide this key news and information um, to our readers and they're responding. And I think that that's the silver lining, which is that we are finding a path to a sustainable business model, but it needs, it's, it's absolutely dependent on community and audience support. That's the way forward. Um, it's a blend of, yes, of course, advertising, um, but audience and philanthropy. And we were able to keep our newsroom working when other newsrooms across the country um, furloughed, layoffs, pay cuts, et cetera, because we did appeal to our readers and they responded um, generously to keep our um, our newsroom working because of the value of the work. So I feel like, um, you know, the crisis has made it, I think has um, enlightened our audience to how important um, what we do is and that we're not really, we weren't okay. I think people just thought, hey, they're okay. They're, they're doing just fine over there. And, uh, and they'll be there. But so I think that that has really triggered a really big part of support from our audience, our readers, the community foundations, et cetera, to really support the work that we do so that we can just not keep doing what we're doing, but add journalists at this incredibly critical time um, in our, in our, in our history. I think when we look back, 2020 is really going to be uh, quite a year. Indeed. It's certainly been an interesting year. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that. Um, 
Why don't we talk about the issues of social justice and racial equity that have come to the fore this year? Um, let's start with Leah. Tell us about how you or your company have been affected by these issues directly. And then I'm going to go around the room and, and ask everyone about that. So I don't think anyone, um, anyone living in the United States hasn't been infected in any way, in some way, by the um, social justice and racial inequalities, et cetera, throughout the country. Um, I can tell you that our, and I'll break it down by healthcare system, and then I'll break it down personally, if that's okay with you, Janet. Um, as many organizations across the country, um, as I said, we've all been deeply impacted by it. And we've always taken a firm stance that behaviors that discriminate against any group are strictly prohibited um, and in, de in direct conflict with our mission, our vision. Um, and that's just who we are as healthcare providers. But more importantly, I think with the leadership of our chief human resources officer, Margie Vargas, she, um, she really led the charge on what are we going to do now that it's in the forefront of the nation? What do we need to do? So in addition to partnering with a dear friend of mine um, with the YWCA of Dade and Broward County and their 21-day racial equity and social justice challenge, um, we've created awareness and importance um, historical events or awareness around those events like Juneteenth and the Tuskegee um, experiment. We've acknowledged racial discrimination and events in our community and society, such as the senseless murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We actually had um, a prayer ceremony across the entire organization. We're in four cities um, spread from one end of the county to the other, and it was very moving to see physicians, frontline employees, people from the community on their knees for that same period of time that there was a knee on George Floyd's neck. Um, we have our president, Aurelio Fernandez, sent a message to the entire organization with a call to action for solidarity. That's the first time that's ever been done in this organization or in the history of this organization. Um, we also launched what we call the Daring Discussion Toolkits that go, went out to 14,000 employees. And it's really to help our leaders start the discussions because what really needs to happen is we need to get comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations. We've had webinars for our 1,400 leaders, managers, supervisors. Um, we've launched a survey to those same 1,400 leaders to identify gaps in their learning so that they can get more comfortable having those difficult conversations with their employees. Um, and we've also shared a list of recommended books and um, resources so that people can start to seek, to learn, to teach, to understand. That's the professional side. The personal side, clearly as an African-American woman, it, it's very close to my heart. But uh, I have a 17-year-old, soon to be 18-year-old son. He is a six-foot general giant who every time he leaves my home, my heart is in my throat. I have anxiety because I don't know what's gonna happen when he's outside of the safety of my home. That is the reality for me, for my family, and for many of my friends and colleagues. And it's not just African-Americans, it's Latinos, it's Asians. Um, that for me, um, as frustrating and as painful as the injustice we have been, um, I feel it's incumbent upon me as the matriarch of my family, as a senior leader in my organization and in my community, um, to seek to understand all sides. So not just the side that I'm on, but even the side that may be offensive to me or that may be uncomfortable for me. Um, I made a conscious decision some time ago to, um, to change the things that I cannot accept. So, you know, there's that poem that says, you know, accept the things I cannot change. I don't, I don't, I can't go by that anymore. Not as a leader, not as a mother, not as a mentor. Um, my role as I see it, not just here in the organization, but in the community is to make sure that we are make, we are the change that we wanna see in the world. 
So that's where I am. That's where my organization is. I'm extremely proud of how the Memorial Healthcare System really took it and ran with it. It being social injustice, racial inequalities, and making sure that we're doing the best we can to educate, teach, train, and hopefully change the culture of, of some of the thinkers out there. Wow, that's really a lot of sorry. Um, emotion <laughs> and action and you know thinking and feeling about this. Yeah, we just have two more minutes left. Um, who else wants to talk about what's going on in your world because of these racial and social justice issues? I'd love to talk about it. I'm very, very interested in this. We have a multi-ethnic staff at Skintype Solutions, and we did the 21-day challenge from the YWCA and um, discussed it. And it was wonderful. It just it's, it's, There were things that people didn't know. And going into it, everybody thought, oh, I already know all this. But we learned so much in, as a group being able to talk about it. And it is, I think it's so important to have that awkward conversation. I'm on a lot of different advisory boards and I've been bringing it up and, and just encouraging people to talk about it because I personally have never been racist, but I didn't really understand the difference between being racist and being an anti-racist until this movement. And I feel like if we all get together and make racism uncool, it's going to make a big difference. And the thing is, is we've all let people slide with little comments. And, and I think we need to learn that you, you can't do that, just like you were saying. And you need to just look at them and say, really? <laughs> did you really just say that? Because if we all got together and we did that, after a while, people would stop and, and it would be uncool. So with our group, um, we're being very active. I, I met Tina Brown here at TCI, and we're going to be doing some mentoring with the Overtown um, Youth Center and some other things. And I was so thrilled to see how passionate my staff was about it. But I want to encourage everybody there in the audience to try to bring up the conversation with at least two people, because you're going to be surprised no matter what race they are. You're going to be surprised what you learn about the way people think and uh, hearing the other side of it is important because we can't all communicate with each other if we don't understand where we're all coming from. Marvelous. Good. I think that's a really good way to end our conversation. We didn't have a lot of questions from the audience, so um, I'm going to encourage you, and Lori's going to encourage everyone in a few moments to connect with our panelists. We're going to have um, opportunities to do that in the future. But I want to thank all four of you so much. It was such a great conversation. I want to I want to keep talking, but I know that we can't. So thank you all so much for being with us, and thank you everybody for uh, for for listening in on this great conversation. Thank you so much. Lori, I think we're going back to you. Wow, what a powerful panel. Thank you so much for sharing your journeys on your path to success and your pearls of wisdom with us. Your insights are an absolutely wonderful tool to help us all in our businesses and in our leadership roles. I'm inspired to do more, be more, be better, and be a better leader, and I hope you all were as well. Please remember that for the next, and Janet mentioned this, for the next four Wednesdays at noon, to spend more time with each panelist. Don't forget to register for their connection and conversation Zoom sessions. And please take a moment now to take our poll. We're about to close it out, determining our not-for-profit scholarship recipients. And it's not too late to donate and send more than one through Strategies for Success. As a matter of fact, great announcement. We just had a donor who's sending number two and number three through. So thank you again to our sponsors, our volunteer breakout room moderators, our raffle collection donors, our panel, and our board for your support. This event and events leading up today are perfect examples of what the Commonwealth Institute is all about. Please don't forget to register your high potential women for our upcoming fall session of Strategies for Success starting on September 29th, and ask us for more information about anything TCI. It's now time for our raffle collection drawing. We had well over 400 tickets. Drum roll, please. Our winning ticket is number 262, and that is Heather Gately. Heather Gately at rider.com. Congratulations, Heather. And lastly, 
our scholarship winner is, hold on, let me pull up. I just got the poll results. Number one is Overtown Youth Center. You've got a scholarship. Number two is YWCA. You have a scholarship set thanks to our recent donor. And number three, Jack and Jill Children's Center. You also have a scholarship. Uh, number four is Habitat for Humanity. And we have a tie between LSF and Epworth. So if we get more donations, we can send more. And I wanna just say thank you for being with us on our first virtual major event and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining us. Bye everyone.